this web lecture, we're going to finish up with the ecdysozoans among the protostomes and start in on the invertebrate deuterostomes. So we're going to take a look at insects, crustaceans, and echinoderm diversity. So first, before we go into the insects, I want to briefly introduce you to another phylum of arthropods, the myriapods. So these include the centipedes and millipedes. So these are arthropods. They've got these jointed legs and appendages, including uh, antennae, which are modified appendages, mandibles, these mouth parts that are also modified versions of these segmental appendages. And then in the case of centipedes and millipedes, many pairs of legs. So they have many, many segments in Centipedes, there's one pair of legs per segment, and these are predatory arthropods. They prey on insects and other small animals, so they're carnivorous, and um, they produce a venom, so these guys are poisonous. In millipedes, their segments are actually two fused segments, and so because of that, they appear to have two legs per segment. These are very important decomposers in ecosystems. They tend to feed on dead plant material and recycle nutrients into the ecosystem. So these millipedes can be another very important component to nutrient cycling. Now let's take a look at the insects. So insects have their segments organized into three sort of super segments. The head, which doesn't really show the underlying segmentation. Um, the thorax, where you can still see some version of the segmentation in the form of the legs. And then the abdomen, which has more obvious segmentation. So they have one pair of antennae on the head. Again, these are modified appendages, so they are serially homologous with the legs. In most groups, the thorax bears two pairs of wings. So this is the ancestral condition to have two pairs of wings. They have external mouth parts. So these are also highly modified, serially homologous versions of these appendages. Their gas exchange happens through a system of air sacs and channels. So these little branching channels are called tracheae and they extend into the body from these little openings called spiracles. So if you remember when we were talking about fungi, why insects are so often uh, the victims of fungal parasites, remember we said that they have these little openings that are just perfect for just kind of sticking a little hyphae into and, and letting it grow into this insect. And so these spiracles are that point of entry that we were talking about. So taking a closer look at the internal structure of this, this system perfuses throughout the inside of the body and basically breaks down into finer and finer and finer little air tubes so that air actually comes very close to each and every cell of the body to do gas exchange directly with individual cells through this tracheal system. So insects also have a large diversity of different kinds of antennae modified for different purposes. So the silkworm moth has these highly branched antennae that are modified as chemoreceptors. They're going to collect up chemical molecules to help them find the females that are emitting chemical signals, these pheromones, to find their way to a female. And we see lots of different sizes and shapes of antennae used for different purposes. And here we see some of the variation in mouth parts. Um, for chewing, you can have these kind of scissor-like mandibles, piercing and sucking like a mosquito, has a long sharp one. Um, siphoning like a butterfly, this is used for lapping up nectar when that, that straw-like mouth part is placed into the nectary of a flower. Um, flies have sort of a sponging mouth part. They just put it in contact with a liquid and it soaks up the liquid and any nutrients that are dissolved in it. And the legs themselves can be specialized for different functions. So you see the anterior pair of legs in this praying mantis are adapted for seizing and grasping prey items that they feed on. This honeybee has legs that are modified as a pollen basket for carrying pollen back to the hive to use. Many insects are predatory and will feed on other insects. And 
Some of them have these very fine spindly appendages that are adapted for being able to walk on the water, for being able to distribute the pressure so that they don't break the water tension on the surface of the water. So this is something like a water strider pictured here um, that has highly modified legs for that purpose. So there's also some variation in life history among the insects. So one possibility is that they can undergo incomplete metamorphosis. So the changes are gradual and the body form doesn't change in any kind of extreme way in the different stages from the juvenile to the adult. So in this case, the insect hatches out of the egg in a nymph form. Usually they're wingless and smaller than the definitive adult form, but they basically are recognizable as the same species. Um, they're just smaller, less developed versions. And then when they go through their final molt, they will take their final adult form with wings and be reproductively ready. Or they can undergo complete metamorphosis, and this should be very familiar to everybody, this idea of a caterpillar um, making a cocoon, going into this chrysalis, and totally reorganizing its body in such a way that the different life stages are specialized for different environments and different food types. So the caterpillar is primarily adapted for feeding and growing. So this is going to be the stage where it's gaining body tissue and putting on weight and basically feeding. The adults would then be specialized for reproduction and dispersal. So especially in the case of the butterfly, it grows these big wings so that it can disperse and move away from its uh, parental population. So in this way, there's no competition between stages. The adult and the um, juvenile are occupying completely different uh, ecological niches. So insects have separate sexes, and they reproduce sexually for the most part. And so fertilization is usually internal, with the sperm being deposited directly into a reproductive tract or they can be also delivered externally in the form of these units called spermatophores. So they will um, present these to the female. The female will actually pick them up and put them into a specialized organ connected to the reproductive tract and store it. So this may be transferred without copulation or sperm can be transferred during copulation. So in the case of a spermatophore, there would be no copulation involved. And in this way, females can store sperm for multiple rounds of egg fertilization. And in some cases, in some species, the female may mate only once in her entire life and store up enough sperm to fertilize all of her eggs before she dies. So now let's take a look at this other group of arthropods, the crustaceans. So remember that the insects are actually a subgroup of crustaceans. We have this new clade, the pancrustaceans, because it was found that the crustaceans are actually paraphyletic and should in fact include the hexapods or the insects. So the crustaceans include crabs, lobsters, shrimps, barnacles, and some other groups. They generally live in marine environments, but can also be found in freshwater and even terrestrial environments. Many crustaceans have highly specialized appendages. So here is an example in this crab of these specialized pinchers and also very, very specialized mouth parts. Small crustaceans can exchange gases um, through the cuticle, so directly by diffusion with the environment. Larger crustaceans will have gills to facilitate gas transport. And most crustaceans have separate sexes, males and females, and reproduce sexually. So now let's take a look at some of the diversity we find in crustaceans. So things like lobsters, crabs, crayfish, and shrimp are part of a group called the decapods. Deca refers to 10, pod means feet, so these generally have five pairs of legs. And planktonic crustaceans, crustaceans that are just floating around in the water column, include many species of copepods, which are among the most numerous of all animals. So these are what we call zooplankton, little animals, uh, microscopic animals floating around in the water column. So nearly as numerous uh, are these shrimp-like krill, which are the major food source for many of the baleen whales. They will 
um, swim along with their mouth open, exposing this filter of baleen that scoops them up and filters them right out of the water in the millions. Um, barnacles pictured over here are a group of mostly sessile crustaceans. Their appendages are modified as uh, filter feeding appendages. And what they do is they have a cuticle that is hardened into a calcium carbonate shell that surrounds most of their body. These appendages can all be sort of pulled into it. And they produce an adhesive that adheres them to a surface that is known to be an extremely, extremely strong glue. Uh, companies with ships struggle constantly with removing these tightly adhered barnacles from the hulls of their ships. Interestingly, barnacles are also notable for having the longest penises uh, relative to their body size of any animal. It's true. Look it up. Isopods are one of the largest groups of crustaceans and probably one of the least well-knowns. They include terrestrial species like the little pill bugs pictured up here. When they're threatened, they roll into this perfect little, perfectly protected sphere that uh, protects them from predators. Uh, but there are also marine isopods, and one particularly interesting one is um, often found in the mouths of fish. And so these are commonly known as tongue-eating lice, but they're actually isopods. So what these guys do is they crawl in through the gills of a fish and they attach themselves to the, to the tongue of the fish. And contrary to their common name, they don't actually consume the tongue. What they do is they suck the blood and cut off the blood supply to the tongue until the tongue eventually falls off. When that happens, they actually attach themselves to the blunt end of the tongue that's fallen off, and they actually become the fish's tongue, both functionally and morphologically. They just live in the fish's mouth, feeding on the fish's blood and mucus and any food um, that they can get a hold of that comes through the fish's mouth. Probably what we're seeing here is a female and a male. Usually a male attaches itself, it's a little smaller, and attaches itself to one of the gill bars just behind the female. So that's probably what we're seeing here. And they just live there until the fish dies. It's not really known what they do after the fish dies, um, whether they find another fish or if that's the end of their life. But very interesting and, and creepy but almost cute in there living in the fish's mouth as its tongue. So now let's move on to the deuterostomes. So again, this is one of the two major radiations of coelomates, the protostomes and the deuterostomes, and it's characterized by indeterminate cleavage, a radial cleavage, and also the blastopore becoming the anus. So this suite of characteristics defines deuterostome development. But keep in mind that there are uh, other groups that have the same pattern of development. So this clade of deuterostomes is based primarily on DNA evidence. This deuterostome pattern of development is not unique to this particular clade. So we're going to start out by looking at the echinoderms. So echinoderms have secondarily lost their bilateral symmetry. So what we generally see in echinoderms is some form of what we call pentaradial symmetry, a radial symmetry that's based on five parts, most easily seen in something like a sea star. And we know that they're derived from, from ancestors with bilateral symmetry because they do have larvae that are bilaterally symmetrical. Unique to the echinoderms are these water vascular systems, these systems of pneumatic tubes filled with water and muscularized pumps that can operate these structures called tube feet that allow the echinoderms to be somewhat mobile. They generally move very slowly, but it allows them to move around in their environment. They have a thin epidermis that covers a hardened skeleton, usually calcium-based plates hardening the body and protecting them from predators. So these are the major groups of echinoderms. So the sea stars and sea daisies comprise one group. Sea daisies look pretty much like sea stars without their arms. And so sea stars, as we'll see in a moment, are generally predatory and actually very nasty, voracious predators. 
sea cucumbers do not even look like they belong in this group. They're highly elongated um, in the oral to aboral direction. So remember with this radial symmetry, you just have an oral and an aboral surface in the case of the sea star. The oral surface is on the bottom, unlike what we saw in something like a cnidarian polyp where the oral surface was on the top. This uh, sea star is going to crawl over its prey item and consume it from underneath. So the sea cucumber will have its oral surface at one end, its aboral surface at the other end. And it's got a very reduced, hardened skeleton. They're, they're generally soft. And they defend themselves generally if they're attacked by eviscerating themselves. So they spew out their digestive system through their mouth and create kind of a sticky mass that's repulsive and confusing to the predator. And they actually regenerate their internal organs after they do that. So pretty interesting creatures and unusual. Brittle stars look superficially like the sea stars. They have highly, highly mobile arms that they can wave around and use to be pretty highly mobile and actually move pretty fast. Sea lilies are highly modified. You would think that it was a kind of a plant. So they use these appendages for filter feeding and these organisms are sessile. So the sea lilies and sea pens are all forms of echinoderms. You may have seen sand dollars walking around on the beach. Those used to be living organisms. The pentaradial symmetry is kind of marked out on these tests, these hardened uh, shells, which are the part that they leave behind that you find on the beach once the living organism has died. The other group is the sea urchins, and so these generally have big nasty spines for protection. They're also mobile using tube feet. The pentaradial symmetry is not very obvious on them, but if you look at the arrangement of their tube feet, you still see this pentaradial arrangement in them. So let's take a closer look at this water vascular system. So the water vascular system is a network of these water-filled canals, and you can see it forms a ring around the central disc where the mouth is located and the digestive system. And then radiating into each of the arms, there's one of these radial canals coming out from the ring canals. And then all of these little muscularized sacs of fluid called ampulla connect to these little tube feet. So you can see a blown up version here. And so when these ampulla um, constrict, they force the water down into the tube feet and they have this hydraulic system of operating these tube feet. They can extend them and retract them. They can stick to things and so they can use these tube feet to kind of pull themselves around their environment. So it functions in gas exchange, locomotion, and feeding. So the tube feet have been modified in different ways um, to capture prey in these, these highly predatory organisms. So I'm going to show you uh, a video. This can be found on YouTube showing how these sea stars can actually be predators when they look so sessile, they're so slow moving, they don't have anything to really capture prey. And so this is a, a video that you can look up on YouTube, but I will just show it here.
Once the tube feet have physically breached the muscle's defensive line, the sea star's translucent stomach begins the final assault. The animal actually pushes its stomach inside the muscle's shell, unfolding like a fatal flower. The stomach unleashes a volley of chemical weapons, digestive juices that dissolve the muscle's soft pink flesh. All that's left is a nutrient-rich soup, a broth that's quickly absorbed by the sea star. Having assimilated the muscle, the sea star stomach pulls away. And the animal moves on, leaving behind an empty shell. Without the benefit of speed, brains, or brawn, sea stars are amazingly successful predators. So that's basically how they do it. They just extend their stomach out through their mouth and secrete these digestive juices onto their prey item. And they are absolutely, as it says here, voracious predators. I can remember one time that I was uh, collecting organisms in tide pools and throwing things into a bucket and not really realizing I took a sea star and threw it in the bucket. And by the time I was done collecting things for the evening, there was nothing left in that bucket except for the sea star. They will eat everything they can get their little tube feet on. And sea urchins, it turns out, are herbivores, but also just as voracious. They can be just as devastating. And so if we look at something like this kelp forest off the coast of California, this very lush habitat, if you get a situation in a kelp forest like this where sea urchins are overpopulating, they can turn this lush, beautiful kelp forest that looks like this into something that we call an urchin barren. They can mow down the entire thing in a very short period of time. And so, as we'll see when we get into the ecology unit, this is a classic story of predator control. Basically, sea otters are the predators of these sea urchins and keep their numbers under control so that they don't devastate the kelp forest landscape in this way.